All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, and then we'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning. Thank we you thank morning. you for your presence. That is always with us, Lord, encouraging us, exhorting us, strengthening us, God. And, and Lord, even as we spend this time in your presence, in your word, uh, teach us, Lord, minister to our hearts and uh, enable us to use everything that we learn together, Lord, to use it in our lives uh, and to impact your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, last class, we talked about... Uh, Sorry, last class we uh, we didn't have a session, but the class before that we talked about chapter eighteen, developing as a leader we must be able to develop the ability to minister the word of God uh, and to minister in the spirit. Right. So we looked at the uh, you know the ability to teach God's word. Uh, it's not a, it's, it's it's important, very important to know the word of God, but it's also very important to be able to teach it to minister it to different people, different audiences. Uh, you know, uh, so as a leader, if you are ministering in a city, uh, we must know how to minister to them, urban crowd. Uh, and then if you go into a village or a town setting, we must know how to minister to their, in, in, in terms of their culture and their uh, understanding, right? And, uh, and also, uh, we talked about baptism in the Holy Spirit, ministering healing, ministering deliverance, right? And counseling. Now, when it comes to ministering healing, ministering deliverance to people, very important is uh, we must be convinced. I cannot give what I do not have, right? I cannot get people to believe something when I myself don't believe it. And so as leaders, you must be completely convinced that the cross of Jesus Christ has paid the price. Colossians 2.15, he destroyed, he disarmed every principality, every authority, every power of darkness, and he made a public spectacle of the enemy triumphing over them on the cross. So you know that you're 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 what you're praying, you're ministering for healing, deliverance. Uh, you know that it it is already done, and you're ministering to people out of the finished work of the cross. So it's very important to uh, see whether we see the healing, whether we see the deliverance. Uh, that is secondary. Of course, we expect it. We know that God says, Jesus Himself says, when you ask, believe that you already received. Uh, uh, but as believers, it's very important to uh, to be very, you know, uh, strong in this in these areas. Because eventually people will come and say, hey, uh, you know, pastor, or come up to you and say, I prayed for so many years, I haven't received my healing yet. It's very important how you minister to them. Right? Because what you say is important. It, it, it can really speak into that person's life. Because as a leader, they'll take it. So whether it's words of life, whether it's words of death, uh, we got to make sure that you know we always focus on words of life, right? Not not the other. Developing the ability to counsel people, right? Uh, so let's get into chapter. We get, we also did chapter nineteen. We talked about uh, the developing functioning functional skills, uh, the skills that we need to. Uh, grow in to be good leaders. Uh, and then we we'll get into this class, we we'll get into chapter 20, developing people and relational relationship skills. Okay, let me just uh, present the notes. Okay, we've talked about this. As a, as a leader, we must understand that ministry is about people, right? It is all about people. Why do we say that? Imagine you you have you set up a conference. Okay, you, you desire to do a conference, or you, if not a conference, you want to have a church. Who is the church? The people. So without the people, there is no ministry. And without ministry, I mean, you, you cannot have any ministry. It's nothing if there's no people involved. Right? So ministry is about people. It's got very little 
to do about the, the way the church looks. When I say church, physical building, the way it looks, the way we, the, the instruments and the things that we have, very little to do about it. We need them, but ministry is about people. So as a leader, develop people's skills. Now, I've shared this before, right? You may not be a person, you know, you may be an introvert, person who's very quiet. I prefer just being in the room alone. That's my comfort zone. That's wonderful, right? But if you want to be a minister of God, if God is calling you into leadership, it's all about people. Do you think it's easy for Moses? Remember Moses, he was, uh, you know, he's stuttering. He can't speak properly. He's 80 years old now. He knew in his heart God called him to be a to be the deliverer. He knew it. He knew it all the while. But do you think it was easy for him to go and stand in front of Pharaoh? For 40 years he was looking after sheep in the mountains. Probably nobody to talk to. Just making sure that you know sheep are fed well and taking care of sheep. So it's quite life. There was no, it was not, it was not like, okay, he had some friends with him at all times. No, he would have just been alone. But there was a shift in his life when God just told him, now, this is what I called you for Moses. So now go and tell Pharaoh. He had to deal with the, the Pharaoh, the Egyptians. He had to deal with the Israelites as well. He had to. It was all about people. Look at the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul. Maybe, uh, you know, 14 years of silence. Nobody knows what he did. But all of a sudden, maybe he did ministry in Tarsus. We don't have an account of that. But he realized that if it's ministry, it's about people. So I have to go. I have to meet people. I have to minister to people and touch people's lives. And, and so as leaders, develop that people's. Because if I don't have it, Develop it, right? Uh, let's look at a few more points here. Developing a liking for people. Right? Look at this word, developing. Right? It's interesting. Right? Sometimes we don't like people around. Right? Uh, we don't like too many people around. But we need, as leaders, we must understand that people are different walks of life. They are at different levels in their spiritual life. They're going through different seasons. Everyone have their set of problems and difficulties and mountains that they have to climb. So develop a liking for people. There's no other option. We have to as leaders. Getting rid of the fear of meeting people. Right? As I said, Moses may he probably has a fear. He said, what am I that I can go to Pharaoh and talk to them? No, I can't do this. I'm, just, uh, it's, I'm better off here. But we have to get rid of that fear. Right? Um, sometimes it's it's our own personal understanding. Okay, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm too young. Maybe I'm too uh, naive. Maybe I'm not knowledgeable enough. Maybe I don't have the appropriate skills. Uh, or maybe I won't know what to speak. Uh, what if I don't understand them? What if these people are you know much higher intellectually than me? So many things. So many things. One of the biggest, you know, fear that you know, I personally had was, you know, when I was 23, 24, uh, we would go on ministry and uh, or we would preach and teach and uh, and and they would come and say, uh, "Can you pray for me?" And I always felt in my heart, "I'm too young to do this." <laughs> You got, so there were times when we would go for these pastors' meetings, and these pastors are probably 30 years in ministry. I'm just 22, 23, and I don't know. I know that they know more than me. I know that they are much more skilled and they have a greater walk with God than me. Uh, and that's, that thing was always there. You know, yeah, how can I minister to them? You know, they're, they're so much uh, bigger and so much uh, more experienced. Uh, but I had to come to a place, and it took a couple of years. I had to come to this place and say, hey, remember Jeremiah? Don't say that you're too young. 
when I've put the words in your mouth, you go and speak it. So I had to, you know, position myself and say, okay, God, this is, it's an honor to be doing what I'm doing. And so help me to do it, remove every fear. Right? And, and so it, whatever it may be you know, for some of us, if we don't have a fear of meeting people, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we do, just, just position yourself, say, okay, God, this is what I'm going to do. Take God's word, use the covenant promises of God upon your life and get rid of that fear. Right? Uh, then proactively meet with newcomers. Uh, there'll be newcomers, you got to go and meet with them, right? Uh, uh, whether it is cell group, whether it is church, whether it's your ministry, meet with newcomers, right? Uh, uh, and, and what happens is you you develop this ability to build relationships, right? So, for example, if there's somebody, you know, at church, they are new to church. Now, I'm sure, right, if your church is about 100 people, uh, they may feel lost. They're new, right? uh, and they make feel lost, and and so it's very important to, uh, yes, we have first time visitors teams and all of that, uh, but even as a leader, try to make the step of going and meeting with them personally, proactively meet with the incumbents. Uh, if you want friends, make them. Proverbs eighteen twenty four: of uh, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Show yourself friendly. Oh, and then you make friends, right? Be sensitive to people, their background, culture, and their upbringing. So Proverbs 16, 21 says, the wise in heart shall be called prudent. The sweetness of lips increases learning. Okay. So be sensitive to people. Uh, even as a leader, uh, you're, you're, you're ministering to people, be sensitive to them. Uh, you you may have people coming from towns, from villages, uh, people from other faiths who are coming. You know, they just become a believer. And imagine, as a leader, you're just grinding on their faith and saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Something that uh, we at APC always focus is not to talk about other religions. We're not going to gain anything. We're not going to gain anything by doing that. That's why Jesus said, they shall know the truth, and the truth will set them free. So our focus as leaders must be the truth, so that the truth will wipe away the faults. And then we don't have to do anything. All we have to do is speak the truth. We don't have to talk about another, you know, another religion or people's culture. We don't have to stand and tell them why you're doing this and it's wrong. Um, or their background is wrong, and all of these things, that's not required as leaders. Our responsibility, God has given us, is to be sensitive to people and to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. And all the other things will go away. You don't have to do anything. Right? Now, they themselves, the Holy Spirit will minister, they will understand. And they will get things out of their life. Right? You don't have to force them. But be sensitive. Right? Be kind, courteous, and wise, but without compromising. Look at this. This is important. Be kind, be courteous, be wise. But be all of that without compromising. It's very easy to be kind and courteous and become compromising. So, so you, you say what you have to say. This is what the word of God is. Right? Now, somebody may come and say, hey, there's nothing wrong in the LGBTQ community. Right? Now, what is our response? So initially, we may, we may feel like it's giving them a piece of our mind. Yeah, this is what thus says the Lord. And we got a couple of verses down there that we speak it to do, being. That's uh, not really necessary. What we have to do is be kind, be courteous, be wise, but don't be compromised. So you, all, all you can say is, okay, I know that you feel that way. Are you feeling that way? Why do you feel that way? Right? Do you think it's a natural thing? Right? Don't you feel that when God, you know, when God created, he created man and woman. 
uh, just be wise in the way that you speak. And uh, no matter how offensive, offensive, so it is a, a, a very important. The gospel is offensive. We cannot help it. We learned about that in lifestyle evangelism. Uh, the moment you speak the gospel, it is offensive. Okay. It, it's not something that people will accept at first time. Right. Meaning, you know, especially when you're, uh, you know, you're speaking to people. Yes, God's word is powerful. It can just speak into a person's heart, change their lives completely. Yes, but also remember, it's offensive. Uh, but it's the power of God to salvation. Mm -hmm. So you got two options. One is they'll say, hey, this is not making sense. Or they're going to take that word and that word of God will be so powerful that it'll touch and change their lives completely. So our responsibility is to stand by the word without compromising, right? Overcome personality weaknesses. Oh, you know, we all have them. We all have personality weaknesses. And this is the best part of a leader, right? We, we understand that we're all a work in progress. None of us as leaders have reached that place of, you know, perfectness and we will not because because we are a work in progress we will only reach the place of perfection when this flesh takes on incorruptibility uh, you know when we when our flesh is gone and the in the the corruptible becomes incorruptible that's when we are perfect so until then there's going to be weaknesses there's going to be challenges that we have to overcome. Right? Here's the thing. God has given us the promises. All we need to do is to apply it in our life. Yes, right? When Jesus says, when, when Peter writes, he says, by his stripes we were healed. That means God has already done it. I've given it to you. You're going to take it, apply it. Right? So, so when it comes to personality weaknesses, don't hide them under the mat. Right? I always use this, right? You can't sweep the whole room, put it under the mat. The room is still dirty. It's uh, you're just hiding it for a while. Eventually, it's going to come out. So write down certain areas in your life. Okay, so these are areas I feel that I'm a little weak. And right? uh, these are my weaknesses. And, uh, and Lord, I need your help in overcoming these weaknesses. We get into the word. And you get into prayer and, and spending time in God's presence. Right? Uh, John C. Maxwell writes in his book, uh, Million Leaders Mandate, a leader's most important asset is people's skills. Let me tell you something. If, if you're able to connect with a person, it is, it is a number one asset that you can have. Imagine you have somebody as a leader, they come up and talk to you, you don't know what to say. And of course, we, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe, we understand that Jesus is working in our lives, the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, but we must have people's scripts. Look at the scriptures. Look at all through the scriptures. From the Old Testament, all up to, the, up to now, right up to the New Testament. You see people, you see leaders. Important asset is people's skills. Firstly, we know that everything is done in the spirit, meaning they go, they pray, they spend time, all of that is there. They also have people's skills. Do you think Daniel became the governor just because he had, he was, uh, you know, good looking or wise? Oh, of course he had people's skills. Do you think Joseph became second in command in uh, in Egypt, because of no people skills, of course he spoke to people. You know, Moses. History says that uh, historical records prove that Moses was one of the greatest Egyptian. Uh, uh, you know, third in command in Egypt, he made he got the greatest spoils from uh, different the, from the countries that they invaded. And it, it was there, and, and so that's an asset that we have people's skills. So use them. Uh, uh, you know, some of us may say, hey, but I, uh, my English is not good. Or I don't know how to speak, how to develop 
how to or what to say. Uh, I got to overcome that. And, uh, how do I overcome? Listen to sermons, listen to people, watch videos. Learn. And now we've got so much available online. You've got AI, you've got, uh, you know, you've got these uh, uh, English people, English skills and speaking skills. You've got uh, seminars and so much that we can learn online just at home. We can learn. And so think of it as an asset, people skills. A good leader can lead can lead various groups, but leadership is about people, right? A good leader can lead various groups, but leadership is about people, right? Um, so, so uh, we talked about that, right? Why is this person able to lead various groups? Because it's because he knows that. All of them are people that I have to minister to. You can have people skills and not be a good leader, but you cannot be a good leader without people skills. You get that? And you can have people skills. Now, there are people who can talk and make friends and make you feel like you know them for years just in the first 10 minutes of a conversation. But doesn't mean they are good leaders. In terms of leadership, they may lack many other things. But a good leader will always look to have good people skills and develop on those people skills. It's always there. You cannot have a leader who's isolated. Right? If, if so, he or she is not going to be an effective leader because ministry is about people. There is a time, there is a place where we seclude ourselves that's what jesus did he when he saw the five thousand people he didn't run away saying oh i'm the son of god uh how do i manage all these people no, he was filled with compassion and they followed him they went all around the sea of galilee they went all the way around to come and meet him thousands of people jesus went in the boat they are walking the other way why because they know jesus would be there but there were times he just went away alone there were times he took his Peter, James, and John. It's about people. So leadership is about relationships. Best example is what the Lord Jesus did. He could have done everything on his own. He chose people. He built relationships with them for three and a half years. Then he released them to leadership. Right? What every leader should know about people. Let's look at that. People are insecure, give them confidence. Now, we are, we are saying this. Uh, now, you may not be any of this. This is just a, uh, to help us understand. Right? You may say, hey, I'm not insecure. Uh, you know, that's all right. Uh, so that's wonderful. But there are people around, right? Uh, people are insecure. Give them confidence. And, uh, so people may not know. Um, you know. They're just new to the faith. They don't understand. Uh, they may come to a life group or a cell group and say, hey, uh, I, I don't really know much. Uh, and, and then there's this whole group of people who are talking about atonement and righteousness and uh, justification. And this person is wondering, what are these words? You know, you know, as a leader, give people confidence. That's number one. Give them confidence. Let them know that, hey, you can be, you can grow into leadership. It doesn't take much. It just takes a little bit of faith and it takes a little bit of hard work. You combine them together, faith with works, and then you'll see God working in them. Give them confidence, right? Uh, people like to feel special, so honor them, right? Uh, very important, right? As a leader, honor people. If somebody has done well, right? Honor them. Give them a word of encouragement. You know, recently we went for. Uh, our youth missions uh, to Hyderabad, another city in India, and uh, all our young people were there. And some of them were the early twenties, like twenty-two, twenty-four. And the way they, sh you know, everyone were given, like most of them were given an opportunity to preach uh, on stage. And uh, I was still amazed by these young people. 
they were so confident, so well prepared. And the way they ministered the word was just, just wonderful. At such a young age, so much of confidence and you know, well prepared, very well prepared. There was no, uh, you know, there was no, there was a continuous flow of you know, what they were speaking. Very well prepared. And I remember talking to a few of them. I said, uh, I just encouraged them. I said, this is so good to see. Uh, and many of them are part of our church. I mean, I mean they're part of the church that uh, at APC East. And I said, you know, I didn't know this. But to see them, just uh, it is so. It's such a, such a wonderful thing to see them. And just picture this: they're only in their 22, 23. Picture them 10 years down the line, just being so confident and so honor these, honor people, honor them. So I'm just giving this example of youth, but they could be people who are middle aged, people who are even in their, uh, you know, uh, uh, advanced. You know, they may be 60 and above, senior citizens. Honor them. They like to feel special. If you got a you know uh, 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 an elderly senior citizen couple always coming to life group, honor them for that because they have hundred other choices, and they can just stay at home and rest because they uh, you know they age, but they come so make them feel special. I honor them for what they do. People look for a better tomorrow, so give them hope. You know the hope of hope in in the Bible. Is a different hope in the world, and the world has a hope of wishful thinking. I hope I get this and this and this and this. And this. But hope in the Bible is different. Like right? hope that does not disappoint. I forget the words, but we talked about it a little bit uh, last Sunday. We talked about perseverance builds character, character and hope, and hope does not disappoint. So when you talk about hope in the bible it is a different hope it's not a hope that is uh, that ends we have a hope right so you give them hope give them uh faith right? i love this verse uh, hebrews 11. Uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for right so there's substance there's hope and evidence two things that single words faith is a substance something that we we have a hope is something that we look into the future and evidence is a result of what we have looking into the future people look for a better hope give them hope right? don't be always discouraging and i remember sometimes i met a few of them that they would ask me why is god so upset all through the old testament he's saying you do this you and then he's saying i will take you into captivity but what is the theme of the Old Testament? In all of these, um, you know, uh, prophets who came, what was the theme? Oh, God is giving them a hope. And you look at Isaiah. You look at Jeremiah. You look at you know, Jeremiah is dead. He's he's sick. Israel is in. It's like an ant, and there's an elephant around, just waiting to crush that ant. And in, in that, God is saying, "Hey." Israelites, you are my people. I have I have plans for you. Plans to prosper. Plans to give you a good hope. Plans to give you a good future. All you need to do is trust me, obey me, and I will take you through this. But you will be, the punishment will happen. That's what the picture is in the Old Testament. Right? The punishment will happen because of what you have done. The Babylonians will come, it destroy Jerusalem, but I'm still with you. But I will be there with you. Right? So the old testament, people come and ask you, why is it like this? It's only a book of hope. It looks like it's not, but it is. Right? So people need to be understood. Listen to them. As a leader, listen to people. Listen to what they have to say. Don't jump to conclusions. That is the last thing we must do. Don't jump to conclusions. Oh, because you did this, now you are going through this problem. That doesn't mean that we are perfect. Yes, the person knows. He, the reason he's coming and he or she is coming to talk to you is because they're probably going through a problem and uh, they want to uh, They want to be understood. They want to be uh, 
Uh, they want to just let out everything. So listen to them without ju being judgmental. People lack direction, navigate for that. Right? As a leader, people may come up to you and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, it could be young people, it could be youth, it could be uh, young couples, uh, people, right? Uh, especially you, they'll say, I don't know what to do. I want to go abroad. And this keeps happening to you know, as a pastor. They come and ask us, what do you think about you know, going to another country? Or what do you think about uh, you know this person as um, for marriage? And so young people, and even uh, there are a couple of middle-aged uh, family families, so they say, I don't know which school should I put my son in? Or, or uh, should I buy a house? Is it the right time? Should I wait? So people have these questions. Uh, now, even here, we need to be very careful. Right? You give them direction. Don't give, make their decision. Right? You give them direction. Okay. This is something that you can try to do. Why? Because this is what God's word says. Navigate for that. People are needy. So speak to their needs first. Meaning, people come up to you and say, okay, this is a problem that I'm going through. Don't say, why didn't you come to church last Sunday? And they're coming to you because they, uh, they have a need. They have, they're going through something. Speak to the need first. Don't go round about, talk about everything else and then come to the need. Respect the need that they have. Right? Uh, people get emotionally low. Encourage them. Now, as leaders, you know, you may be in a place where you are emotionally low. And then you have people who uh, look up to you as a leader and they are emotionally low. Now, here's the thing. We must first learn to encourage ourselves with the Lord. And then we give it to people. Remember we talked about David? David went, he, it was for Samuel, he did the chapter, but he went, he, uh, with his armies, he went, he destroyed, uh, he went, he attacked the uh, the neighboring cities and he came back and there was, the enemies had come and taken uh, the wives and children and everyone they've taken and they've gone. The Bible says that the, the his his people were ready to kill David. They were ready to stone him to death. David himself, his wife was gone. The, the army, their wife and their children and their families and livestock, everything was gone. They've come back to a dry, empty place. But what did David do? David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what he did. Was it a difficult situation? Yes. They were, they were going to kill him. They were going to stone him to death. But he's encouraged himself in the Lord and said, okay, don't worry. That's what we'll do. He went, he prayed, and God told him, you go, you overtake them, and you will get back everything that has been taken from you. And it happened. I imagine David put on sackcloth and ashes at that time. The others also would have done the same thing. Remember when they came and said, Saul is dead, David put sackcloth and ashes, and everyone else did the same thing. So there's a time where we need, you know, even when we are low, we encourage ourselves. And we were able to, uh, you know, encourage others as well who are emotionally low. It takes a lot of effort. It takes, uh, you know, we need to come to this place of saying, okay, God, I'm going to look at what's happening to me right now. But I'm going to trust in your Holy Spirit. I'm going to trust in what your word says. Right? People want to succeed, so help them win. People desire relationships to provide a community, uh, get people connected to each other. Uh, people seek models to follow. So very important, be an example. Be an example, right? People look at you, you know, one of the things in leadership is, you know, it's nice to be in this place of leadership. But remember, people look up to you. And 
they want to model what you do. It is it is natural, right? Now, if you are doing things in the right way, you'll be able to be the right example. But if you if we are doing things in the wrong way, people wouldn't want to model that. So when we are called, we be good examples to what God is. Right. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts on this developing people and relationship skills? Okay. All right. So then, let's get into chapter twenty-one: developing counseling skills. Okay. Now, how many of us? Uh, I, I'm sure. Uh, so Jean will be talking to, and I don't know if it's in this 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 semester counseling. Mm -hmm. It was the previous semester. Okay, so we had, uh, you know, you had counseling, and you, I'm sure you learned a lot about counseling. What counseling is all about, and uh, now this is an area that, um, again, just like anything else, we we keep growing in. Right? It's it's not it's not like we've achieved it just because we get a certificate saying that we finished the course doesn't mean we we know everything, right? Uh, we develop our counseling skills, right? And why is this important? Because, again, as, as I always mention, as a leader, people will come up to you and ask you what I must do. It's natural. You can't tell the person, don't don't ask me. And they, we have to. They will come, they'll ask. Right. So let's look at a few uh, practical insights on developing counseling skills. Number one, oh, develop the art of listening. Listen. Don't jump into conclusions. And I think number one rule in counseling is to listen. They are coming to you for counseling. So they must speak more than us. And sometimes that doesn't happen because we've got a set of Bible verses ready. And for each problem, there are different Bible verses. And we're ready to give those Bible verses out. Or sometimes we've, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, people have gone through a certain situation and we give examples what happened to them. No, we must not do that. Uh, we must develop the art of listening. So when people come, learn to listen to them. Let them share their heart out. Right? Especially, uh, you know, if they're going through a very difficult situation, develop the art. This, well, you know, it's, it's it, as leaders, it's very easy for us to talk. We are tuned that way, right? We have people skills, right? So we are tuned to talk, and that's our forte. But this skill is also equally important. We are listening. Right now, I'm, there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is you can hear a lot of things. It's going into your ear, and then it's going somewhere else. That's hearing. But listening is to hear intently and to you know, to process it in our in our mind and in our spirit. That's what listening is. So when a person is sharing his, you know, challenges or problems that he's going through, develop the art of listening. So you say, okay, this is what he's going through. It's been two years, he's going through this, he's grieving about something that's happened in his life. Uh, so God, what should I say? How can I understand him the right way? Right. Uh, and, and that way you're able to give the right uh, uh, counsel. Ask the right questions. Very important. Ask the right questions. So, uh, for example, a husband and wife will come up to you and say, you know what, this he forgot my birthday. And the wife is very upset. Right. So how can he forget my birthday out of all the days? Now they're upset. They haven't been talking to each other for five days. Now, this is just an example. And so they come for counseling. They come to you as a leader. You're the cell group leader. 
I'm not talking to him. Why? Because he didn't, he forgot my birthday. Now, this is just a scenario I'm giving, right? So as a leader, what is the first thing you must do? Don't say, how can you forget your wife's birthday? It's going to get worse. Right? So you got to ask the right questions. What happened? Is it is it something that happens every year? Number one question. No, it doesn't happen every year, but this year it happened. Okay, so then there's a reason it happened this year. Right? And so you ask him for that. So can we ask him, like, uh, what is the reason? Maybe he was crowded with work. Maybe he didn't know what day it was. He was just so, uh, it was just a regular day, which he forgot it happens. And, and so asking the right question, okay, this is just a hypothetical situation, right? Uh, and then you build confidence and hope in the person. That is the ultimate goal, right? Uh, when they come, build confidence. The word of God is to build confidence, to build hope, to encourage. Prophecy is to exhort, to build them up. Okay? Uh, give room and time for the person to open up. And right? so in that 45 minute session, you may speak for two minutes. That's okay. It may be, you know, the first or the second session. In the first two sessions, say, for example, you'd schedule the session 45 minutes. They may speak. All you have said is, I come and be seated. That's it. After that, they have continuously 43 minutes, they have spoken. That's okay. That's the point. You need to let out everything. And then there'll come a time when you will speak into their lives, right? Because everything that's inside has been taken out. And now that emptiness can be filled with the word of God, with the godly counsel that you're going to give them, right? Very, very important point is to speak the word of God. Okay. Now, one thing that we do at APC is always minister minister through the word of god visions dreams prophecy word of knowledge all of that is good that's good we, we we believe in that we we like to flow in all of that but speak the word of god because the word of god you know sometimes we'll say hey this is what i sense and uh, so you go and do this now, it could be backed up with God's word. Right? Isaiah 54 and 5. The Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakened morning by morning. He wakened mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God had opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Right? So in situations like this, but they may say, what must I do? What must I do? You speak the word of God. So, for example, if a, um, if a mother comes up to you, or parents come up to you and say, this is what my son is doing. He's disobedient. He's doing whatever he wants to do. And, and what should I do? Right? You, you give your suggestion. You give your counsel. Now try to back that up with the word of God. That holds more weightage. It's like a, you know, you write a letter. You say, you know, you're writing a letter to somebody. At the moment, there's a seal and a stamp on it, and a signature. It has more weightage. And that's what the word of God is. When you give counsel, you back it up with God's word. It has weightage, because people may forget the word. Of counsel that you've given them, but they may not they will not forget the word of God. Right? So try as much as possible to put give uh, you know when you give counsel, back it up with the word of God. Speak God's word into their lives. Right? Depend on the Spirit, and again, right, even as you're counseling, depend on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord, Isaiah. 11 2 to 4 shall the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom understanding counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord look at that 
spirit of wisdom. Did Jesus have it? Yes, he did. Spirit of understanding. Yes, he did. Spirit of counsel. Yes. Might, knowledge, the fear of God. So depend on the Holy Spirit. Lord, what should I do in this situation? What the Holy Spirit, one thing that we can praise, Holy Spirit, give me the right words and the right counsel to share with this person. Give me the right counsel. The Spirit of the Lord has all of it. it says here, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon you. The Spirit of wisdom. Right? God will give you the wisdom. God will give you the understanding. Today, saying this, you'll be able to understand it in your spirit, and then you'll be able to give the right counsel. You'll be able to, uh, you know, with the spirit of knowledge, the knowledge that we have, he translates the Holy Spirit translates that knowledge and gives you the right word of counsel. That when you give it to people, they will know that is from God. And it may be just a human vessel. But they will know it is from God. And God has given me this. They can take it and hold on to that. Right? So depend on the word of God. Back up your word. With, back up your counsel with the word of God. Depend on the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Right? Be practical also. Right? Um, and, and when you're giving counsel, be practical. Right? Uh, don't ask people, okay, you go off to another city. It will be better there. No. We got to be practical. Direct the individual to get professional help if the situation goes beyond what you're able to handle. And many a times people have come up to me and said, This is what I'm going through. There's this, there's this young boy who was, you know, going through these tendencies of uh, hurting himself. And I was ministering to him, uh, but I knew that this could get very serious. So I remember just, you know, directing them to professional counseling and they needed it. So good professional counselor. Um, when necessary, minister correction, but do it in love. Right? Now, it's not like the Spirit of the Lord will only give encouraging words. There'll be times. Correction is part of God's way of dealing with us. So he will deal with us. He will bring correction. So even we can bring correction, but we do it in love. Then guard your time. Especially as leaders, um, you know, counseling can just take hours and hours and hours, right? So guard your time. Remember that you've got other tasks to do. You've got a family to look after. Uh, so be very careful on the time that you're spending. Husband-wife situations, again, if you're ministering to husband and wife together, uh, uh, never minister to a woman alone. If it's husband and wife, do it together. If you have to speak to a woman alone, and if you're a male, uh, have to speak to a woman alone, try to get, you, not try, you must get your wife involved if you're married. Now, if you're not married and you know a wife comes to you, a, a woman who's married comes up to you, direct them to a person, to another woman who is married. And, uh, you've got to be wise. You got to have. You can remember, the spirit of wisdom and understanding is points. No, but this person came to me, so I must minister. No, not necessary. I came to you. You can always direct them to the right person, right? Because you must, you must protect yourself. And then there are teens and young adult situations, right? Uh, again, you got to be careful. As, as leaders to draw the line, to know where to draw the line, get people involved, uh, especially if it's uh, teens and young adults, uh, you know, don't cross boundaries. Uh, get your, if you're married, get your wife to, you know, get your spouse to come along and be there during this time, protect yourself. Uh, Here's what Mike Murdoch says: You never, you are never responsible for the pain of those who have ignored your counsel. So our responsibility is to give the counsel. If they take it, it's good. But if there's, if they don't, and then there's pain, you are not responsible. You can just let go and say, God, you've done your part. Right? Okay. So 
we'll stop here. We'll pick up from next class. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. See you next week. God bless you guys. Bye.